Farone, I don't loathe you. The atmosphere in the multimedia hall changed instantly. Noticing that there was something wrong with Farone, Albert turned to him. When he tried to talk to Farone, his son grabbed his mic. Abel, talk to me Abel. Alarmed, Albert took a step back and, in a panic, pressed a button with one hand, turning on the lights in the ceremony room. Farone felt the wind blowing near his ears. When he turned his head to see what was happening, Albert already slapped Farone's face. Being slapped hard, Farone lost his balance and fell onto Sophie's seat. Seeing this, Albert's guests stood up and surrounded Farone and the outsiders. Feeling the tense atmosphere, the trio stood up, ready for a fight. Farone stood up with a hand covering one side of his face. He stood near the trio. With an obviously disappointed face, Albert stepped forward. His facial expression told the others that he knew this would happen. Albert looked at Farone and his new friends. You disappoint me so much, Farone. You conspired with the outsiders, only to disobey your only family, to upset him? As soon as Albert finished that sentence, Albert tried to punch Farone in the face, but Farone stepped back to dodge forcefully, and threw a straight punch. Like father, like son. The fight started as Albert was beaten. Four guests and the butler surrounded the trio, especially the girls. Seeing this situation, Sophie pulled out her knife and brandished it. She managed to stay away from her enemies, although she failed to attack them. Elizabeth, who was behind Sophie and knew how to fight, focused on one of the guests who seemed to know nothing about fighting. She beat that guy easily, while Mitchell was besieged by the butler and a man, having no chance to counter. Elizabeth kicked over the man and quickly looked around. Farone and Albert were struggling hard with each other. Two men tried to attack Sophie, but they were afraid to approach her as she had a knife in her hand. Elizabeth turned around and kicked the butler over. Mitchell finally had a chance to catch his breath and to pull out his knife from his pocket. Without saying a word, he thrusted the knife into the oncoming fist with a reverse grip. The blade stabbed through the fingers and in the wrist. It hurt too much that the man could not react to other things but only the pain. Mitchell took out the knife and kicked the man. He rushed up to the man while the man was still shouting out of pain. He buried the blade in the man's shoulder. He twisted the knife before taking it out. Four left. The butler, who was kicked over by Elizabeth, get up quickly and roared as he pushed Elizabeth from the ground to the wall. Mitchell wanted to help but someone pushed him from behind, against a chair. It was Sophie who banged on him. The two men found out that Sophie didn't know how to fight, so they grabbed her knife directly. However, Sophie was too agile for them to catch, so they threw a chair to Sophie. Being unable to dodge that, Sophie fell over together with the chair to Michael's back. Before they could react, one of them dragged Sophie away and wrestled her to the ground, cursing in a low voice. He grabbed Sophie's hands and pushed them against the floor above Sophie's head. He slapped Sophie. It was so hard that she immediately felt dizzy. While Sophie was suffering from pain and dizziness, she saw that the man was going to take her knife. She straightened her arms, drew her legs up and kicked the man in the stomach. The man suddenly lost his strength and was kicked over by Sophie. Sophie grabbed her knife and stabbed the man in the thigh. At that time, the butler and Elizabeth were fighting in the corner of the hall, while Mitchell was struggling with a man. Sophie's heart froze. She quickly went over to the butler and stabbed him in the back. Not expecting this sudden attack, he failed to protect himself. However, unexpectedly, he did not fall just like the others. He grasped Sophie and pushed her against Elizabeth. The girls bumped into each other. Sophie could feel nothing but dizziness and pain from her thigh as the butler kicked her. He was aiming at Sophie's knee. At the moment the butler kicked Sophie, Elizabeth aimed at his knee and kicked exactly on it. Losing his balance, the butler fell on a chair and passed out. Mitchell was still fighting with a man. The two girls grasped him by the arm so that Mitchell could thrust his knife into his waist. This man couldn't move anymore. The trio looked at Farone, who was still able to stand. He was panting when he looked back to them. Albert was lying on the ground, seemingly unconscious. Sorry. Come on, let's go.
We're going to the ceremony room. Farone came to his sense when he heard that. Exhaustion resulted from fighting disappeared completely in a blink of an eye. He ran, too fast that the others could hardly catch up. Wait, I have the key. Farone immediately stopped, turned back to grab the key, and ran straight to the ceremony room. They chased after Farone who ran too fast. Before they reached the other side of the Kamara, he had already opened all the doors on their way. As they reached there, they saw a severely wounded man sitting on a chair, and Farone, who was stunned, standing in the room, looking at the walls. All four walls were covered by closely spaced words carved by the boy who lost his sanity. Those scratches were sentences from a tragedy of madness. They could feel their hearts were filled with freezing horror as they read those words. Of, of course I will, how couldn't I? All of them looked at one of the walls, and the sentence that stood out from everything. Failing to keep her fear and shock to herself, Elizabeth murmured. Will you sing for my grave? The words in the ceremony room were carved so densely that it was difficult to read them from a distance, except that sentence. It was carved large and deep particularly, as if someone had deliberately written it in such a way that people could see it at a glance. However, the sentence was written above the camera. No one could see it unless they come into the room. They knew there was no time for them to lament what was in the room. Sophie rushed to check the condition of the prophet. Wounds covered his body, deep and shallow. The most serious one was a gunshot on his soul. Leaving aside his injuries, the prophet was unconscious, and had no sign of waking up. They needed to carry him out. Farone, Michelle, help carry him out. Farone looked back, bewildered, at the man. It took him a few seconds before he went over and put the man's hand on his shoulder to lift him up. We can't get out like this. Even if we did, we'll soon be caught. Don't worry, I've prepared for this. The house will be full of fog, so be careful when you move. As Mitchell spoke, he took a piece of paper out of his trouser pocket and lit it with a lighter. Smoke rose from the paper. Farone and I will take the prophet out, and you will get the CDs. When Mitchell finished that, he put the prophet's right hand on the back of his neck. The boys lifted the prophet up together. The key. Take it. I'll get a car from the garage. You can leave from the main entrance. Run along the way if you don't see us. We'll go find you. Be careful, guys. The two girls went back the same way they came. As they just reached the laundry room, their sight was already blocked by white color. Sophie almost tripped for several times, but Elizabeth, who was walking in front of her, pulled her up. They heard screams and shouts of people. They felt the wind blowing near them as someone ran past. They could not see it even if someone stood in front of them. They could feel the existence of each other only by holding each other's hand tight. Elizabeth remembered the way and soon found the stairs to the first floor. She then went to the door with relief at the end of the corridor, just as Mitchell described. She opened the door using the key and closed the door after entering. Smoke had not entered in the room yet. There were a few bookshelves on the left while there was a study desk on the right. A locker was facing the door, with an eight-digit padlock on it. Eight digits. Try o o o o o o o o or any birthday or date of death. I'll look around for any clues. Sophie rummaged through the room, but only found piles of business agreements and paper, while the smoke was invading the room quietly. The girls were so desperate that Elizabeth stopped trying the password and grabbed all the books out of the bookshelves. Sophie, turn on the lights. Read this. She found a diary hidden behind a book. When she took it to the desk, thin layer of gray color already covered their sight. They could hardly read the content even if they read it under the desk lamp. Stella closed her eyes forever today. Damn it. What have I been doing? I lost myself in those damned magics. I lost my wife. I lost the time that I could have spent with her. Why did I believe in this magic? Why did I believe that it could save her? 
There is never omnipotence and omniscience in the word, for own, my poor child. I must go on for him. How can I believe that magic really exists? That it was simply because I can't use it. What a waste that people in 1600s had never think of making the most of magic. They wasted those ladies. Fortunately, in 1998, I found a capable witch. Regardless of the cost, I must prepare for Pharaoh's future. He will live a good life no matter what happens. Is this, is this the password? Time, time, come on, it's either 16,001,998 or the other way round. Elizabeth rushed to enter the code. Being barely able to see the numbers on the padlock, she had to confirm it with her finger. Praying that it would be the code, she pushed the padlock, and the metal locker was opened. Neither of them could see what was inside. They grabbed everything that felt like a CD and stuffed them into their bags. As Sophie reached for CDs, she suddenly felt like she grabbed an object made by paper. Being told by her intuition that was very important, she took it. After filling their bags, they left the room hand in hand. The servants had seen the smoke before and were running out of the house. Someone opened the front door and the yellow lights outside stood out in the white mist. The girls ran out of the mansion, no matter if anyone found them or not. They ran all the way down the road in the snow. They heard something similar to shouts of servants from behind. Sophie, Elizabeth. Hearing a car hoot behind them, they turned around and saw Mitchell and Farone. As soon as the girls got into the car, Farone pushed the accelerator as hard as he could. After getting into the car, the girls saw the prophet was in the back seat with them, while Mitchell and Farone were seating in front of them. Farone was calling someone. I need help. I'm driving on highway number two to Palos. We're being chased. Please send someone here and help us as soon as possible. I'm Farone Fairsang. I can't explain everything on the phone at the moment. Please send someone to highway number two immediately. Someone is dying. Without saying any more, Farone hung up and called another person, who picked up the call quickly. We're on our way. You and Alice now go to the police station quickly. Tell them that Farone Fairsang, who just called earlier, sent you there. Also, tell them that Alice is an important witness. Farone called the police again. He explained everything in detail once the police picked up the phone. They felt a sense of relief as it seemed to all of them that they were safe then. Who? Once they were relaxed, all the exhaustion came over them and they didn't want to move anymore. They thought they were going to make it to Palos. Hearing a deafening shot from the back of the car, the girls screamed. Mitchell immediately checked the rear view mirror and saw a car coming up behind them, with Albert, who just shot them, in the passenger seat. It's Fairsang. Get as low as you can. A few shots rang out in quick succession. Farone frowned, hoping that the police would arrive soon. His wish was not heard by the god. The car suddenly went out of control after a shot. Farone did his best to hold the car steady. Luckily, they didn't crash. The car wobbled for some distance before coming to a stop in the snow. Everyone knew that Albert was coming to get them. They didn't have the time to get their weapons in hand before the window near Sophie was smashed by the grip of Albert's gun. He searched for the door lock to unlock the door. Sophie drew her knife and stabbed Albert's arm with fear. Albert roared out of rage outside and withdrew his hand. The car door was already opened. He opened the door and pulled Sophie out using his wounded arm. Elizabeth failed to pull Sophie back even she tried hard. Sophie! Everyone got out of the car. Not to let anyone take the profit away, Farone stood by the car, while the butler and a servant were coming at him. As soon as Elizabeth got out of the car, she heard another shot and a scream. Ah! For a moment, Elizabeth forgot how should she react and just stared at Sophie, who was slowly sliding down on the ground with her back against the car. No! Oh no don't! Albert missed and shot at Sophie's right arm. Albert raised his gun again, determined to kill the girl. Elizabeth thought she was going to be frightened, but at that moment, she was surprisingly calm. She knew she had to get revenge for Sophie. She knew she had to protect Sophie. All the plans and possibilities flashed through Elizabeth's mind. 
the girl screamed loudly near Albert and pushed Albert from his right. At the same time, Albert fired, with his gun pointing the sky. Screw you! Albert turned back and saw that it was Elizabeth who had pushed him away. He pointed his gun at Elizabeth and another shot rang out. Without aiming properly, the bullet grazed Elizabeth's shoulder and cut her hair. She couldn't hear anything other than tinnitus, but it didn't matter. What mattered the most was things that she needed to do at that moment. She stepped quickly in front of Albert, grabbed his gun in both hands and raised it. Thinking she was going to take the gun, Albert grabbed it even harder and hit Elizabeth in the stomach with his knee several times. However, Elizabeth gritted his teeth in pain and did not let go. She put her finger into the trigger guard and pressed Albert's finger. Elizabeth fired several shots before Albert realized that she was going to use all the bullets up. He yanked Elizabeth away. Mitchell rushed to check Sophie's wound when Albert wasn't looking. The wound was deep. Without any first aid supplies, Mitchell could only use his scarf to stop the bleeding, praying that she would make it until the police arrive. Can you hold it yourself? Sophie was still conscious. She was pressing the wound with her another hand lightly that could not help stopping the bleeding. She kept looking at Elizabeth. Hang in there. Mitchell stabbed Albert in the waist with a knife. Albert paused for a moment in pain, and Elizabeth took his gun. When the butler saw that Albert lost his gun, he immediately came and stopped Mitchell from doing anything. The butler came prepared, with a machete in his hand. Mitchell caught a glimpse of Farone's clothes with a few slits on it. He can't tell how badly Farone was hurt because of the thick clothes. While Mitchell was distracted by his friend, a silver light flashed before his eyes. Mitchell dodged subconsciously. The butler cut through the air near Mitchell. When Albert tried so hard to get his gun back, Elizabeth kept retreating while shooting. After three more shots, there was no more bullets in the gun so she used it as a blunt instrument to hit Albert. She did hit Albert in the arm. However, out of the blue, instead of retreating, Albert slapped her with another hand. Although Elizabeth was still on her feet, the gun was taken back from her hand. Albert grabbed the gun using a backhand grip and hit Elizabeth on the temple with the gun grip. Elizabeth. Elizabeth was losing consciousness and she could no longer stand properly. She couldn't hear Mitchell well due to tinnitus. She only knew that he was shouting. She felt like there was something cold on her face. Her senses were becoming dull while nausea was becoming stronger. Finally, before completely losing her consciousness, her heard a sound similar to a police siren.